Wednesday night at 9, join us for the season premiere of Shannon, starring Kevin Dobson. I got a case for you. Being conducted by the launch sequencers on board the orbiter, T minus 20 seconds and counting. The SRB hydraulic power units have started. The SRB nozzles have been moved to start position. Coming up on 10, T minus 10, 9. We have go for main engine start. We have main engine start. Minus three, two, one. We have ignition. We have ignition of the solid rocket boosters and liftoff. Liftoff of America's space shuttle, and the space shuttle has cleared the tower. Houston now controlling the mission control. Confirmed roll maneuver started. 20 seconds. Thrust looks good. 25 seconds, roll maneuver completed. 30 seconds, Columbia now one nautical mile in altitude. 35 seconds, status check commission controlled by Flight Director Neil Hutchinson, giving a go at 40 seconds. Columbia Houston, your go at 40.
With that call up, England truly now committed to space travel. They can no longer turn around and return to the launch site. Four minutes, 35 seconds. Columbia now 60. Columbia Houston, you're pressed to ATO. I'm being pressed to ATO. Looking good here. Four minutes, 44 seconds. Uh, for the first time, Columbia has uh, forward abort to orbit capability on two engines by throttling engines up to 107%. Columbia now 68 nautical miles in altitude, 189 nautical miles downrange, velocity now reading 10,300 feet per second. Columbia Houston, your normal throttles. Copy that, normal throttles. Five minutes, 14 seconds. That call up by Capcom Brandon Stein says that England truly now capable of abort to orbit on two engines without throttling up Columbia's engines. Five minutes, 25 seconds. Columbia now 68 nautical miles in altitude, 228 nautical miles downrange. seconds, uh, standing by for press to Miko. Columbia Houston, your press to Miko. Roger, press to Miko. Five minutes. Good show, Dan, this is really smooth. Five minutes, 55 Great. seconds. Enjoy. The press to Miko call from uh, Capcom Brandon Stein says, should Columbia lose but one engine, press on, keep flying forward. Columbia's engines have enough uh, energy to a two, uh, to achieve Let me just in your single engine rotor and everything's looking good. Okay, Dan, yeah, single engine rotor and looking good here. Mark, six minutes, 18 seconds. That report from Capcom Brandon Stein indicates if a two engine failure occurred, Columbia is capable of an emergency landing at Rota Naval Air Station, Spain. Mark, six minutes, 30 seconds. Columbia now 68 nautical miles in altitude, 346 nautical miles downrange. Velocity now reading uh, 14,900 feet per second. Uh, well, Columbia is launched. Again. Okay, now, what do you think of that? That was incredible. At 31 seconds, I have to admit I got nervous. I think I everybody was sort of waiting for a stop. Just, just an incredible sight, that, that huge power that's there. You can almost feel it through your television set. I don't think we've seen pictures that sharp, that clear, that high up before. Not, well. Certainly not that far away. No, it was 68 miles, I think the last pictures were roughly 70 miles high and 225 miles downrange, which I don't know if you compute that out how far away from the camera it is, but uh, it's a long way. We could almost watch that thing until it got into orbit, could we not? Very well. In fact, actually, technically, it was in orbit, at, at, or in space, by the theoretical definition of being in space. And they had their they had their signal for main engine cutoff, and uh, after that, they're coasting. That's right. That's and when they if just. If you coast. think of the nautical mile distance downrange, it's it's almost the equivalent of being able to view something in Montreal from Toronto. Mm -hmm. To give you that perspective, <laughs> and that. Just to, uh, to complete that perspective, though, to give you an idea of how high Columbia really is, even once it gets into its orbit, uh, if the Earth was a peach, Columbia is still within the fuzz. <laughs> so we're not we're really that show. high. <laughs> All right. We, have, we, have, uh, we, we will have some replay of that launch in a few minutes. In the meantime, we have some pictures of the, of the launch of the first Columbia flight. And uh, I think we should have a look at those now. This was on April the 12th. About uh, 750 feet long, maybe uh, you can see it better from here. Uh, maybe six, seven hundred feet long, maybe uh, 150, 200 feet wide. It's really impressive. I'm glad we couldn't see that. <laughs> Thank goodness for no rearview mirror. The ride was was very smooth throughout this. Up in the uh, transonic phase, it shook just a little bit. There's coming through Max Q. This is a. Uh, a camera inside the, extra, uh, inside the orbiter from the ET doors and shows the external uh, solid rocket motor separation. Isn't that a spectacular shot? And then we show it again from inside the cabin, although the light is much brighter than this. And they then flash across the windscreen. This shows that we never saw these pictures, but here's a picture of a separation outside uh, from high-speed cameras. And isn't that terrific? Uh, from onboard sensations, the only thing we really saw was uh, the flash of light and our normal avionics cues that we had dumped the solids. We did not see them go away nor feel any joke. We're less than 1G right after separation transverse Gs, and this baby 
baby is just chugging along, and it's just as smooth as glass, that ride is. Here you see some particles coming by John's window, a uh, couple of white objects. There weren't one that uh, was indicative of the kind of stuff that we've been seeing uh, throughout the uh, flight. This is uh, back in a, this is umbilical separation back in that uh, view that we saw, and this is external tank separation, and it is a spectacular sight. That white particles you see there are ice uh, caused by the, the hydrogen freezing as it's coming out, perfectly nominal. There's the, uh, the hit fitting that goes up in the orbiter, there's the umbilical plate, and there's the tank. And as you can see, all this black material there, that's the way the SOFI works. It's chars and turns black, so it's a high heating area in there, and it really caught it. And there's another place that's sort of discolored up here toward the nose of the tank. There was supposed to have been a tumble valve uh, actuate to start uh, the vehicle tumbling, uh, and it did not work. And it, from our standpoint, it gave us a, a much better view of the tank. You'll also see the nose uh, discolored. It almost looks like the nose is uh, it's got all the sophie gone from it, because there's a, a sort of metallic color there, but that might be bright. Yeah, we're, we're not sure of that, and uh, people are analyzing that still. Uh, this is a scene of me uh, climbing, out of the, climbing out of the seat. Uh, all the operations associated with the suit and the seat while you're in zero G are, are much easier to handle than it is down here on Earth. I'm just stuffing the, uh, the helmet in a, a little bag along with the gloves so that we can, we can tuck them away. There's quite a few connections associated with that suit, but uh, it's no real problem to handle at all in zero G. In 1G, we had a lot of problem with this helmet. It was always bumping into the hand controller and firing things. There you see it's up there out of the way. We finally got it right. That can float nicely. Mm -hmm. This is uh, an ops uh, mode 8 check out of the hand controller. You move it to full throw, and then you read on the cathode ray tube, which is where I'm looking, uh, to see if the hand controller is working properly. And this is very exciting. A little bit of this. I'll last you about six months. Look at this. Um, this shows the mobility that we have down the mid-deck. People thought we needed restraint systems to tie ourselves down in there. You don't need any of that. Now watch this mobility that Bob has when he kicks off and goes up uh, to the top side. Boy, I'll tell you, if that isn't the neatest thing in the world. The thing about it is you don't really go flying around. Uh, just, you need to move a little bit slowly, otherwise you'll end up banging into something, but uh, there's no problem controlling yourself any place you want to go. Well, the voice of Crippen and Young, the crew of the first Columbia shuttle flight, uh, describing some of the things that happened on their flight and some of the things that are happening right now on board the second flight of Columbia. We've had the external tank separate, so uh, now Columbia looks like an airplane again. We, we, have a, we have some uh, a replay now ready of the launch, and if you watch this, you can just feel the, the tremendous power of, of this machine as it takes off from its uh, launch pad at Cape Canaveral at the Kennedy Space Center. This is the way the launch went. Ten minutes behind time, but all went perfectly well anyway. Moment of ignition. And a liftoff. It doesn't waste any time. Oh.
it is really a return to space. I'm going to show you the launch from a, still another angle. You, as you might guess, we've got cameras scattered all over this place here, down there. Well, I don't think there's any question, Norm, some of the most graphic pictures we have ever seen of a space launch. And as, uh, as David says, history being made today. It really is. It's, uh, as I say, well, chaps, we face the moment of truth and we've come through it. Uh, for the first time in mankind's history, we have relaunched a space vehicle back into space. And that's what this whole program is all about. There are quite a few firsts on this flight. What are they, Bob? Uh, the first on this flight, other than uh, using a spacecraft twice, is that this is the first winged spacecraft to ever fly. It is the first spacecraft to ride piggyback on its fuel tank. I said before, uh, something that ugly should not fly. <laughs> <laughs> normally, normally what they do is uh, the rocket is on top of its fuel tank, as has been in the past in the old Apollo days. Um, another first is that it is the first spacecraft to make a wheeled landing instead of dropping down into the ocean as the Apollo rockets did or landing on land like a cannonball as the Russians do when they come down. And it's, uh, as David said, the first one to come back, be turned around, put back in the launch pad and launched again. Just to tell you what's going on right at this moment, the spacecraft is now rid of this fuel tank. We saw it last after it got rid of its solid rocket boosters and we saw it sort of flying in this upside down configuration. They have since detached this part, which will now fall into the Indian Ocean uh, later on this morning. That's the non-recoverable part. That's right, this is the only throwaway part uh, hopefully they'll fix that in the future. The main engines, which are these three very large engines on the back that are fueled by that tank, have naturally shut down. And there are two smaller engines that are now powering the spacecraft and putting it up into its final orbit. And these are called the Ohms engines, orbital maneuvering system. So the spacecraft right now is flying upside down and the astronauts have a very beautiful view of the Earth. Uh, they're looking down on that and uh, black sky up above. It's al almost now coasting uh, like a catapult. It's been fired and it's on its own now. It's, uh, there's no engines functioning at this point? I believe the Ohms engines are still running. They are they're, still they're, running. They're still bringing it up just to its final orbit. So it will come into its final orbit and uh, pinpoint its way around for another five days. That's right. And you then, left then out, it's free fall. You left out one first, Bob. The first time we've had a grandfather in space. Oh. <laughs> um, a launch on his birthday. That's too. right. 44, a 44-year-old grandfather. Uh, Engel is five years older than yeah. Truly, but Truly is the grandfather. It's amazing what technology can do. <laughs> now, as far as this uh, device that uh, went strange this morning, this MDM, uh, whatever it was, that they flew in from California, I assume everything is now working and functioning as it should with that unit. It, it, the only anomaly during the entire launch was that there were a number of what they call nuisance alarms that were ringing off in the cockpit, and these are, if you can believe it, relatively routine little alarms that are really just notify the crew to take a particular look at something. It's not that something that actually has gone wrong, it's sort of an alert, be, beware of this. Other uh, than that, perfect. In the first fight, we had a great deal of attention paid to the ice that was coming off the tanks. Haven't heard anything about that on this one, at no, all. No, and it... Uh, certainly didn't seem to be a problem. And I suppose they wouldn't be able to tell right now if there are any of the of the uh, heat plates that have shaken loose. No, they won't be able to tell that until they uh, open up the payload bay doors and actually look out the back window. That's that will take have a place. We'll get to see that payload about an hour from now. For the first time in our famous Canadian arm, we'll be seeing whether it survived the shock of the launch and all. It's quite a quite a delicate piece of machinery. If I can interrupt yes. Harvey, I just noticed David Onley, this man of science. I don't know if the camera picked him up, but his first scientific feature was this, crossing his fingers. <laughs> That's scientific, isn't it? That's scientific. <laughs> well, the second flight of Columbia has taken place. It was a picture-perfect launch all the way. No real trouble so far. Uh, they've got five days still to go. Five days, four hours, and ten minutes. And But so far, it's been very... Uh, nominal, as they say at NASA. It's, everything's been perfect. Uh, they should be in orbit any moment, and uh, we will have updates as, uh, as they are required. We will keep you informed of what's going on with the second flight of the Columbia shuttle.
can lose one of the three engines and still get in orbit by utilizing their fuel through the remaining two. Five minutes. Columbia now 68 nautical miles altitude, 189 nautical miles down range. I'm going to show you the launch again from another uh, angle. There's that water flood to suppress right, the yes, turbulence. Shock wave. Yes. See it starting. And <laughs> this is the CTV Television Network.